this is going to be section 4.2. Uh, there's a reasonable chance that this is not the longest lecture of this semester. Um, absolutely need to have a TI-83 or 84 to get through this section or be real comfortable with the calculator that you have. Real quickly before we get into the section, you're going to need to get your calculator set up to do the problems that we're going to get in this section. And real specifically, um, you're going to need to get the catalog button activated. My catalog's on the zero, so if I hit second in catalog, you get a list of all the different functions the calculator has. We're looking for something that starts with the letter D. I think, but I'm not sure, if I hit the alpha button and then the key that tells the letter D, I could actually find that. I can't see it. Yeah, alpha and D. That didn't work. Oh, well. I'm just going to arrow down then. I thought I could just get it to go to the Ds. I'm using my down arrow after I did the second in catalog. And I'm getting to the option that says diagnostics on. You need to hit enter when you get your little diamond here on diagnostics on. And then hit enter again. And then when it says done, your calculator will be set up to do the stuff in this chapter properly. So I did second, hit the zero button for catalog, went all the way down to diagnostics on, hit enter and enter again, and now my calculator is set up. If you don't do that, uh, there's something that my calculator is going to display that your calculator may not display. So this is a section on using semi-realistic data and to what we're going to do is we're going to come up with the equations that kind of fit the data and we're going to use the equations to answer questions so it's very easy in the real world to generate lots of data and if you want to use data to make predictions or to analyze the data one nice thing to do is to come up with an equation a function that models the data and that's kind of what this section is going to be we're going to, every problem that we're going to be presented with is going to have a table of data. We're going to come up with an equation that won't exactly fit the data, but that could be used to pr make predictions that are relevant to this data. So as I look at the, this instructions, I didn't blow this up specifically because I hope that you could read it and um, I wanted things to be, um, I don't know, fit on the pages the way they are. So we have this data that relates the hours students spent studying to the math score they got on the SAT test. Uh, I s suspect this is just completely made up data, but, but it's possibly real, real data, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. So the first thing the author asks me to do is asks is there a linear relationship so can a, in a is an equation of a line something that could be used to predict your math score based on the hours you spent studying your math score in the SAT based on the hours you spent studying for the SAT and um, we're going to follow these tasks and answer that question so the first thing the author wants me to do is come up with a linear regression model and a linear regression model is just an equation of the line so this linear regression model is just a, an equation of a line that will say models the information or the data and since I can't fit information here, I'm going to write data as opposed to information. So we're supposed to come up with an equation of the line, a line that models this data. And we'll start to do that. So I'm going to eventually do parts B, C, D, E, and F, I'm pretty sure, unless I somehow deleted one that I forgot. But to get through part A, I need to follow some steps. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to enter the data into lists on my calculator. Very specifically, I'm going to take the hours spent studying and enter them in list one on my calculator. L means list, 
one list one, and I'm going to take the math scores on the SAT and enter those on list two. And this is not terribly hard to do. What I'm going to do is hit my stat button, and then after I hit my stat button, I'm going to select the edit option, so the edit and edit number one. So under the edit key, after I hit my stat button, I hit enter on one, and Hopefully you see list one and list two, L1 and L2. If you don't, just arrow around the top. Eventually, you'll come across list one and list two. If your lists, like my list, have numbers in them, then you need to clear the list. So to clear my data that I have in list one, I arrow up using my right arrow till I get the L1 blackened out. I hit my clear button that's above the up arrow key and hit enter, that wipes out that list. Now I'm gonna to arrow to the right and then get the L2 darkened. And I'm gonna do the same keystroke. So I'm gonna hit the clear button and hit enter. Now I've deleted all my entries in those lists. And now I'm gonna enter in list one, the first column and list two, the second column in the order that they're presented. So I'm gonna go four, nine, 10, and just enter all the data as accurately as I can. If I mess up and enter one number wrong, then my work's not gonna match the work on the sheet. So after I enter both lists, I'm gonna just quickly check just to make sure I haven't made a mistake. But I'm just mindlessly pressing buttons using my arrows to move around the lists. When I'm entering the numbers on the list, if I just hit enter, it moves me down a list, which is nice. So I don't have to keep using the arrow. Just hitting the enter button will allow me to move, you know, enter data on the list. All right, so now I'm gonna check just to make sure that my list and the list that's here are the same. So the first thing I see is 4390, 9580, 10650, 14730, 4410, 7530, 12600, I didn't have, yeah, 12600, 22790, 1350, 3400, 8590, 11640, 5450, 6, 5, 20, 10, 6, 90, 11, 6, 90, 16, 7, 70, 13, 700, 13, 7, 30, and 10, 6, 40, and nothing after that. So after the 10, 6, 40, there's a blank in each of the list ones and list two. So that you need to have your list set up like that to be able to follow along. So just you know, pause the video if you need to pause the video. Get all that data in your calculator and then we'll be able to move on to the second page of this. The second thing the author wants us to do is to graph the data to see if it even makes sense to find an equation of a line to use, make predictions from the data. And this is easy enough to do to do this, I'm gonna hit second and y equals. So I hit the second button and then the y equals key. I'm, I'm on plot one and I look down the list here, plot two, plot three. There's no, um, there's no ons for these plots, that's good. If one of these plots set on, I'd have to turn it off, but yours should probably all stay off now. So I'm gonna hit enter on plot one I'm gonna turn it on, and it says the X's are on list one, the Y's are on list two. If that's not the case for you, if you don't, if you're, if, if this said something like, my X's was list three and my Y's was list two, you need to get the cursor flashing on the X list, hit the second button, and then my L1 is on the one key. So you need the X list to be list one, the Y list to be list two, and I always just leave my the here it's just going to plot the points, and you can tell it how it wants to show the points. And our auth, this guy, he used um, that square box like that, that open square. So I'm going to use the open square just so I can make a graph that looks just like that author's graph. 
Okay, and now I want to graph this to make that picture that the author has. To do that, I'm going to hit my zoom button and arrow down to number nine. So I'm hitting zoom and then stat. Now when I hit enter, that graph is remarkably close to the graph on this sheet. So I'm doing well so far. So you should get to this point where you've entered the data, you're able to graph the data. Now it does look like I can draw a line and this data kind of lies on the line. It's not perfectly on a line, but it's semi-linear. So I'm going to come up with an equation for the line or a line that kind of fits through the data as best as possible. And to do that step, I'm on step three now. I'm hitting my stat button. After I hit my stat button, I hit right one to calc. And then I go to option four that says linear regression. Linear regression is a mathematically statistically sound strategy technique for finding an equation for a line that models data. There's some, if you take a stats class, you do these by hand. I'm going to hit enter and then enter again. And I magically get, um, and something that is not exactly an equation of a, a line, but it, there is an equation of a line hit here. When I read through the, uh, my calculator, and what my calculator is displaying, it's displaying an equation of a line plus some other junk. Because if you look at what my calculator says, it says, it says y equals ax plus b, and then under it, it says, a equals 25.32326, and then a bunch of stuff. B equals 353.16, and then there's stuff with the R squared and the R that I'll talk about later. But this is telling me that if I use the, this equation, change the A to something like 25.3, I'll be consistent with my, our author, our author rounds to one decimal place. So I'm going to go 25.3x plus 353.1. This is an equation that's going to go through this data reasonably well and an equation that I'll be able to use to make predictions about the data. So what our author wanted so what I did right here is I came up with the, an equation. This is the answer to part A. This is the determine the linear regression, regression model to represent the data. That's what I just did right here. And the second thing on my tasks is to graph the new equation. The author does something slick with the graphing. I'm not going to be as slick as the author because I'll forget how to be so slick. So what I'm going to do is take this equation, enter it in Y1. So I'm going to hit my Y equals button. I'm going to clear out anything I have in my y equals. Now I'm going to type 25.3x plus 353.2. I don't have to worry about a viewing window because when I hit the zoom stat, it made a nice viewing window for me. Now I'm going to hit my graph button. And what I get compared to what this line is, it's exactly the same thing. So this is a graph. And this shows me that the data the number of hours studied relative to the score kind of fits on a line. There, not er, No point or very few points are exactly on this line, but nevertheless, this line matches, it matches the data pretty well. So I can probably use this line to make predictions. So that was the step two. Step two said graph this. Step C says decide whether this equation is a good fit to represent the data. Visually, it looks like it represents the data well, but there's something that's more mathematically profound than saying, yeah, it looks good. And that's what this, this next step is. The next step says, you know, is this model a good fit? And if I look at my, when I did stat, calc, linear regression, if I look at the, um, if I look at the R of this, the R is 0 0.933605, and mathematically that's good. If when you do the linear regression, if you get 
a 0.8 or bigger for the R, which we call the correlation coefficient, that tells me that the line is, is a good fit. If, if the R in this computation was under 0.8, then it's not that good of a fit. So to be to, for, to answer the question, is this a good fit, I looked at the graph and yeah, yeah, it looked like it kind of mod went in the same direction as the data, but is it really good to make predictions? The higher this R is, the better the prediction, the better the model is going to be for predicting. If the R was 1.00, then it would go through every point exactly. Every point would be perfectly on the line. Being a 0.93, that just kind of means, yeah, most of the points are really close to the line. So anytime we get an R a 0.8 or greater, we're going to say, yes, this is a good good fit. And and then the author, the, the, I stole this from the, from the internet website, they talk a little bit more about the R squared. And um, when you get into a stats class, I'll, I'll save that for your stats teacher. That's not anything we need to worry about. But if the R was a number less than 0.8, then I would probably not use the line to make to answer questions that rel, rel, relative to the data. And I might do some other sort of equation um, because there are other shapes or other kinds of equations that you could use to fit data that might be better when the R isn't big enough. So if I go back to the questions, decide whether this equation is a good fit. Yes, it's actually a really nice fit because the R was 0.93, which is bigger than 0.8, and anything over 0.8 we say is a good fit. The next question says interpolate the data. Interpolate means to not go beyond the data, but to answer a question within the data are so if I look at the hours students spent studying students spent between four and 22 hours studying and I'm asked to figure out or predict if I study 15 hours what my score is going to be and because that 15 is within the bounds here between four and 22 I'm interpolating the data when we get to part F we're going to extrapolate the data Extrapolate means go beyond the data. So this data was used to look at p students that studied between 4 and 22 hours. And if I'm predicting somebody's score of 15 hours, I'm within the 4 to 22 range, so I'm interpolating the data. When I get to part up, extrapolate, I'm going beyond the data to predict the score of a student that spent 100 hours studying. So I'm extrapolating, I'm going beyond the data as, a, as opposed to interpolating. So question six says interpolate. So a, if a student studies for 15 hours based on the study, would he expect, what would they expect to get on the score? Well, what would they expect to get on the, um, what would they expect to get? And to answer that question, I'm going to use the equation that we just came up with and the, the rounded version of the equation. The rounded version of the equation that we came up with was y equals 25.3x plus 353.2. And it, for this particular equation, the x is it from the first column. That's the number of hours that they studied or that, that you study. And the y is from the second column, and that's going to be the SAT math score. So I'm going to use the equation that we came up with to answer questions. And anytime I'm asked to use this equation to answer a question, I'm either going to plug a number in for x and solve for y, or plug a number in for y and solve for x. And in, st in this particular problem, because I want to predict a score given 15 hours of studying, that 15 hours is an x. So I'm going to plug into the equation 15 for x. So I'm going to go 25.3 times 15 plus 353.2. And I'm going to break my calculator out. I'm going to go, this is 25.3. Not that that looks anything like 25.3. I'm going to go 25.3 20, times 15 plus 353.2. And I get 732.7. So None of the scores were, um, all the scores were integer scores. So I'm going to round that and I'll say the score should be about 733. So that would be a perfect answer 
are as nice of an answer for the question to interpolate the data. If a student studies for 15 hours, what would you expect the score to be? I'd expect the score to be about 733. E is a similar question, but it's backwards. E says, if a student scores 720, how many hours would you predict that, that the student studied? So again, I'm answering a question. I'm going to use the equation, and the question gives me a score, and it wants to predict the number of hours the student spent studying. Because the 720 is a score, and the y's are the score, when I go to solve this problem, I'm going to plug 720 in for y. So I'm going to go 720 equals 25.3x, issues with that, plus 353.2. And I'm going to solve that by minusing 353 from both sides. So I'm going to go 720 minus 353.2. When I do that, I get 366.8 equals 25.3x. And I'm going to divide by 25.3. So I'll go 366.8 divided by 25.3. And I get 14.49. And then I rounded to 14.5. I wouldn't feel bad if you rounded to 14 or up to 15 because the initial data, there was no fractional hours. You know, maybe it doesn't make sense to give a fractional hour answer. Um, when I write a test question, hopefully I'm kind enough to tell you how to round so you don't have to guess. But 14.5 seemed like a reasonable way to round that. So that's the fourth thing, that's the part E of this. Now I'm going to do part F, the extrapolating the data. If a student spends 100 hours studying, what would they expect to score? Discuss the answer. Um, if you know something about the SAT, there's only so many points you can score. If you, if you score perfect, I think a perfect score is 800, so it's impossible to score over 800. And so if I'm extrapolating the data here, uh, what would I expect to score if I study 100 hours? I'm going to plug 100 hours in for x. I'll go y equals 25.3 times 100 plus 353.2. And then if I do that on my calculator, I go 25.3 times 100 plus 353.2. And I get that the student, if they study 100 hours, will score 2,883 point two or 2,883 on the test. Um, and you're supposed to realize that, that this is silly. So using an equation that models the data to make predictions, you have to understand that the, the equation is going to be limited. And it's actually the author 2,885.8. I don't know why we have a slightly different number, but it, this what I have, I'm content with the 2883.2. Um, so this is really this, although this answer is what the equation, plugging 100 into the equation for x gets me, it's not a reasonable answer because you can't score over 800. Nobody in the world can get 2800 on that test or 2900 on that test. 800 is a perfect score. So when you extrapolate the data, you, the further you move away from the data set, the less accurate your prediction becomes. So in this problem, because the largest amount of hours in the data was 22 hours, and we tried to extrapolate to 100, 100 hours, we're so far away from the actual data that our prediction starts to get weak. And so we have to understand that if we're extrapolating go, and going beyond the data, that the further we get away from the actual data, the less likely or the more inaccurate our prediction is going to be. Beautifully, this is everything that's contained in this section. There's only six word problems in this section. We'll do the three evens right now. We'll leave you the three odds for homework. Every single problem essentially asks me to do the same sort of steps. Graph the data, come up with an equation for a line that fits the data, Decide if that equation is good to make predictions, and if that equation is good to make predictions, then make predictions using the equation. Now I'll dig into the section. I'll do number two. Number two gives me um, some information, and it talks about the numbers 
of insured commercial banks in thousands in the United States for the years 1987 to 1996. So it said in 1987, there were 13.7 thousand, so that would be 13,700 uh, insured commercial banks in the US. To convert the 13.7 into actual number of banks, if I take the 13.7 and multiply it by 1,000 because it says the numbers are in thousands. So in 1987, there were 13,700 insured commercial banks. In 1988, they were, if I take 13.12 and multiply it by 1,000, there were 13,120 commercial banks. In 1989, if I take 12.71 and multiply it by 1,000, there were 12,710 commercial banks. So in the years 1987 to 1996, the number of insured commercial banks were going down. That's because companies like Bank of America and Chase were buying small banks. And where you had, you know, when they buy up a bank, it just gets absorbed. So if they bought, you know, Valley National Bank was bought by Bank of America, well, then the number of banks went down because they're just being bought up. So this is kind of showing that that was happening from the, the late 80s to the mid 90s. Again, that doesn't have that much bearing on doing the problem. So I'm going to make, I'm going to enter data. And when I enter the data, the X coordinate is going to be the year. And the Y coordinate is going to be the number of, I'll say, I'll just say the number of banks rather than writing insured commercial banks. And then it's going to be in thousands. So if I want to multiply by 1,000, I get the actual number of banks. I could enter the numbers exactly how they're written. But what the hint says to do is to change the years to smaller numbers. And this is an effective thing to do because it makes the equations easier to work with. So the first thing I'm going to enter is the number 0, 13.70. And that says in 1987, there were 13,700 insured, I'll just say banks. And, and then when I do 1, 13.12, that's going to mean in 1988. So 1 stands for one year after 1987, which was 1988. There were 13,120 banks. And then the, the 2 comma 12.71 is going to be 2 stands for the year 1989. And the 1271 is going to be 12,710 banks. So I'm going to just enter all these points. And to do that, I hit my stat button. After I hit my stat button, I hit enter on the edit. I clear out the lists that are already there. So I go up to the top of list 1 and hit clear over up to the top of list 2 and hit clear. My lists are cleared. Now I'm going to enter in the X column the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Arrow over to the list 2, enter 13.70, 13.12, and just I run right down the, assuming I do them properly, I just go right down the table and fill in my list two. And then of course it's a semi big deal to do this accurately. And so after I enter all the data, I'm gonna double check myself. So I have my data in, I'm gonna arrow up to the top. The first point I have is zero and 13.7, which is good. One and 13.12, two, 12.71, Three, twelve point three four, four, eleven point nine two, five, eleven point four six, six, ten point nine six, seven, ten point four five, eight, nine point nine four. Let me check that again. Nine point nine four, ten point four five, ten point nine seven, eleven point nine two, twelve point three four. So I think I have the data in perfectly. Unfortunately, I mean you just. You have to stop looking at your data at some point. Now I'm going to make a scatter plot. To make a scatter plot, I hit 
I hit, I already have my scatter plot on. I would normally hit second and y equals and turn the scatter plot on, because, but because it's already on, I can just hit my zoom and stat button. So I'm gonna hit my zoom button. I could arrow actually up to the stat key or down to the zoom stat key, and it's gonna fix my window for me. That almost looks perfectly linear. So that is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to graph the data, and that graph, I'm gonna cheat and just say, see my calculator. And if this was a test, I'd give you a blank graph paper, a blank graph that you could just plot these points. But that's how the graph is supposed to look. So that's the answer for part A. Part, oh, I actually do have a graph there, for what that's worth. There, there's my graph I actually cheated. I used another computer program to sketch that graph because I knew I didn't have the desire to graph. So there's the graph, that's the answer to part A. That's the, what, that's the scatter plot. And again, this X axis stands for the year. And the Y axis is the number of insured commercial banks. And it's going to be real important to know that the X stands for the year and that the Y is the number of banks because when I go to answer the questions, the numbers that I'm going to be given are going to be an X or a Y and I have to know where to plug those in. So that's the end of part A. Now I'm going to drift down into part B. Part B says I use a graphing calculator to fit the linear, a linear function to the data. So I'm going to come up with the equation now. To come up with the equation of, the, of a, a line that models this data, I hit my stat button. I hit arrow once over to calc. I go down to linear regression. And this tells me the equation is y equals a. And I'm just going to round this to negative 0.46 x and then for b it's plus 13.68 our author did one decimal i just felt the urge to do two decimals here um, again on the test i should be more specific and tell you how i want you to round because i don't expect you to write all the decimals down for the a and the b so i just took the a put it in front of the x put the b after the plus sign and that's the equation and when I look at the R, because the R is, was actually negative 0.99, it's, it's negative because the slope of the line is negative. Because this is absolute value-wise greater than 0.8, so, so since the absolute value is greater than 0 0.80, we say it's a good fit, or a strong fit. If the R was less than 0.8, then I probably wouldn't use the equation to make predictions, and I'd create some other kind of function to model the data. So there's the answer to part B and C. Now I want to graph the data, and I'm going to hit my Y equals button. I'm going to clear out the function that's in there. I'm going to type negative 0.46x plus 13.68. Hit my graph button because my window got set for me. And that really goes through the graph, I mean, just stellarly. That's almost perfect. Almost every point is almost perfectly on the graph, which makes it almost a perfect linear function. Because that 0.99 for the R, I knew the points were going to really be spot on the graph. So again, I cheated and used a other program to graph it, and it shows there's the graph. I'm not going to use the graph to answer questions, but that's the, that's the picture that I asked you to make. Part E, so I graphed, let's just say C other, C calculator, calculator, or the sheet is, this is 2D for what it's worth, other sheet. And now, the, there's only one question, and this is extrapolating, this is going beyond the data, to predict the number of commercial banks in the year 2000. Well, to do that question, I have to know what number to put in for 2000, and on my little table here, 
1996 standed for 9 for x. So 1997 is going to be 10 for x. 1998 is going to be 11 for x. 1999, if I wanted to know that, I'd plug 12 for x. And if I want to know the number, predict the number of commercial banks, insured banks in the year 2000, I have to plug in 13 for x. So because I'm giving a year, I know that the x stands for the year, so I'm going to plug a number in for the x. And the number I'm going to plug in for the x is not going to be 2000. It's going to be 13 because 13 is the number that stands for the year 2000. So I took my equation from up top, took the number 13, plugged it in for x. I'm going to go negative 0.46 times 13 plus 13.68, and I get 7.7 .7 for y. And that's thousands of banks. If I multiply it by 1,000, I'd get 7,700 insured. Hopefully that's spelled right. If not, sorry. I know that looks worse. Commercial banks. And that's all there is to do for that problem. I don't think there's a part F at all. No, there isn't. So each of the problems that we're going to do, the next two problems, have the same skill set. They give me uh, some data that I need to understand. I need to enter that data in the lists, come up with an equation of a line, see if that equation is a good, equa a good equation, then answer some questions. Question four gives the, the winning time in the 400 meter swimming event in the Olympics from 1936 to 1996. Not that any of you were around, but in 1940 and 1944, uh, either they weren't Olympics or at least the U.S. didn't go to the Olympics because of the World Wars. I just don't think there were Olympics. So this data, the X represents the year, the Y represents the score in minute, the time in minutes of the 400 meter um, swimming event. And so in 1936, the winner was in five minutes and. 5.44 minutes, that's not 5 minutes and 44 seconds, actually 0.44 minutes. If I go 0.44 times 60, that would be 5 minutes, 26.4 seconds for what that's worth. So 5.44 minutes is 5 minutes, 26 seconds. I'm not going to convert each of the data points into minutes and seconds. I'm just leaving them as minutes. Similarly, 5.3 minutes, the 0.3 minutes, if you multiply 0.3 times 60, that's 5.3 minutes is 5 minutes and 18 seconds for what that's worth. That's not terribly important. I need to enter the data, and I'm told to do this. Let 1936 stand, stand for year zero. So the first data point I'm going to enter is zero, 5.44. And then for 1948, the number I'm going to enter for 1948, I'm going to go 1948 minus 1936. That's 12 years after 1936. So I'm going to enter 12 comma 5.30. So 12 would stand for 1948. It's 12 years after 1936. And then 1952 is four years after 1948. So I'm going to enter 16 comma 5.20, and then every other gap is going to be four years. We didn't miss any Olympics. So for 1956, because that's 20 years after 1936, I'm going to enter 20, 4.91, and then for 1960, I'm going to enter 24, comma 4.84. I'm not sure why the gap in the table, and then 28, comma 4.72, and then 32, comma. 4.53, and this is going to be 36, comma, 40, comma, 44, comma, 48, and then, of course, the number 48, 52, 56, and the last one's going to be 60, comma, 4.12. So I'm going to enter each data point by transforming the year to a smaller number. So to do this, I hit my stat button, hit enter on edit, Clear out the list one at a time by getting the list highlighted. 
hitting the clear button and hitting enter. So my list one is going to have 0, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, 32, 36, 40, 44, 48, 52, 56, and 60. And then my list two, 5.44, 5.30, 5.20, 5.25, 5.26, 4.12, and 4.12. And then again, double check to make sure your data is incorrectly. If you enter one number wrong, it just is going to make the whole thing wrong. Or just it's not going to match up with mine. So I'm just double checking at this point to make sure what I have is reasonable. If I entered one thing, one data point slightly off, it's just you're not going to be, my answers and your answers are going to be different, and then all of a sudden that's probably not a good thing. So I think I have the data in perfectly. I'm going to make my stack scatter plot by hitting the zoom button, going up as opposed to down to number nine is quicker. And there's my scatter plot. Oh, the other line's still in there. Let me hit my y equals, clear out that line, and go back to the graph so I only see the scatter plot. So there's a scatter plot. And it's kind of linear, but then at the bottom here, it's not so linear. It's like if it, was, if it was perfectly linear, it would keep going down. This flattening out part makes me, you know, think that when I come up with an equation for a line, that my r might not be as high as the last r because the data is not perfectly linear. So there's my data plot on the window that I chose to use on the software program, and it's the slope isn't as steep but you can still kind of see where it's not as linear the whole way down. But this is fine. This is a scatter plot. This is a scatter plot. That's a scatter plot. They're just on different scales. They're perfectly fine. And I have to understand again that the X represents the year and the Y is going to be the winning time in the 400 meter. I won't write the name of the race. So the X is the year, the Y is the winning time. So that's the end of part A. Part B, now I want to come up with an equation to fit the data and decide how good it is in part C. So I hit my stat button, go over to calc, go down to number four, linear regression, and hit enter. And I get R still pretty darn, darn high. It's a negative slope, so the R is negative. So the equations of the form Y equals AX plus B the A is negative 0.026. I'm going to write negative 0.03 and round the two decimals again, just because I feel that's probably slightly better than the one decimal. And for the B, I'm putting 5.46. So that's the equation. And even though it doesn't look that linear because the R, the absolute value of R is greater than 0.80, we say this is a good fit. If it was less than 0.80, I wouldn't even use the line to to make predictions. Now I'm going to write this in my y1. Go 0.03x plus 5.46. Hit my graph. Oh, I forgot the negative. So you can tell I messed up because my line didn't go through the data. When I go to my y equals button, I need to insert this negative here. Negative 0.03x plus 5.46. And when I hit enter and graph that, now it's going through the data pretty closely. So even though these points are kind of far off the line, most of the points bunch up on the line. That's why we say it's a good predictor. It looks like it's probably going to be better at interpolating as opposed to extrapolating because the points um, in the years, you know, 1936 to maybe 1980 something are close to the line, but these years in the 90s get to be off the line. But that's okay. I'm living with this equation to make my predictions. And here again, I cheated and used a program to make my line. And that's, I can just copy that from my calculator as well. So, so this again, this right here is 4D. Let's see calculator. 
I'd like to think when I write the test, I don't actually make you do these graphs because it's a nuisance. Predict the winning time in 2012. I need to know what number to plug in for X, the number to represent the year, because year zero was 1936. The number that I'm going to plug in for X is the difference between 2012 and 1936. So to answer a question to predict the winning score in a year, because the year standard stands for X, I need to plug a number into the equation for X. I have to know what number represents 2012. I have to figure out how many years 2012 is after 1936, so I subtract. I'm going to plug 76 in for x. I'm going to go y equals negative 0 0.03 times 76 plus 5.46. And again, this is getting beyond the data a little bit. This is extrapolating. And it looked like my data towards the end of the line was not bunching up on the line so well. So I'm not sure how great this prediction is going to be, but I can still make it. So negative 0.03 times 76 plus 5.46, and I get 3.18, which is just three minutes as opposed to four minutes. If I, if I look at the winning times in 1936, it was like five and a half minutes. In 1996, it's down in the four minutes. And if you look the, from 1976 to 1996, the time really hadn't gotten noticeably better, kind of four, maybe four minutes and 20 seconds that might be. Um, I suspect that this predicting the winning time being 3.18 minutes is probably unreasonable. I'm probably extrap extrapolating too far beyond the data. And I wonder if I have a part F. I don't have a part F, but this right here, this is what the equation predicts. But I don't really think that prediction is probably fairly that accurate because when I look at when I look at the data, it doesn't seem reasonable that in 16, in the 16 years from 1996, that they're gonna cut a whole minute off the time in being that between 1976 and 1996, um, only seconds were cut off the time. But nevertheless, I can use my equation to make predictions. When I'm extrapolating, going beyond the data, my predictions aren't always that great. All right, last problem we get to do. Um, this shows the number of Target stores worldwide between 1997 and 2002. And it says, so in 1997, there were 1130 Targets. In 1998, there were 1182 Targets, and so forth. I'm going to use 0 for 1997, 1 to represent 1998, 2 to represent 1999, 3 for 2000, 4 for 2001, 5 for 2002. I'm going to enter the data and make a scatter plot. So I hit my stat button, hit enter on edit, clear out list one, clear out list two, enter zero, one, two, three, four, and five in list one, and a 1,130, 1,182, 1,243, 1,307, 1,381, 1,476 in my list two. So I've entered the data as well as I can. Now I'm going to hit the zoom button, go up to find zoom stat, and hit enter, and I get a graph that looks a lot very linear. So I expect my R to be super high when I actually come up with the equation. So again, I think I graphed this using some graphing package. So this is my answer to 1A. If you look at this graph, and the graph my calculator gave me, those are strikingly similar. So the window that I picked is close enough to the window the calculator picked. So there's my scatter plot. The data definitely looks linear. Now I'm going to find my equation of that line, or predict you know, an equation that matches that line by going stat, calc, going down to number 4, linear regression. The equation is going to be y equals 68. 31x plus 1115.71, putting the A and the B into the formula. Look how high the R is. The R is 0.99. That's a great fit. That data is almost perfectly linear. So maybe extrapolating here might not be such a bad thing. Now I'm going to graph this. I'm going to hit my Y equals button. Clear out the function that's in there. Type 68.31x plus 
hit my graph button, and that graph white, oh, the points are almost all perfectly on the line, which is good. And again, I'll, if I want you to graph on the test, I'll give you something to graph, but this is part 6D. There's a graph that I just plotted it. I'd like to think again on the test. I just don't make you do the graphing because I know you can graph lines and points if you had to, especially if you're just copying it from a calculator. So this is C, calculator. And then lastly, predict the number of target scores in 2020. I have to know what number to plug in for X because X is the number of years because 1997 was year zero. I'm gonna take 2020 Subtract 1997 and get 23. That's what I'm going to plug in for X to make my prediction. So I'm going to go Y equals 68.31 times 23 plus 1115.71. And when I do that, if I do that properly, do 68.31 times 23 plus 1115.71, I get 2686.84. Can't have 0.84 target source. I'm going to round that up to 2687. So I'll say about 2687 target stores in the year 2020. That's the whole section. So every problem that I picked, the two, four, and six, had exactly the same instructions, um, plot the data, find an equation, how good of a fit is the equation, graph it, and answer one question. So I can't ans ask you anything more than that on the review or when we get to the t test question. So hopefully this was a really friendly section and um, well, not take that long for you to master it. All right, hopefully is enough. Hopefully I didn't make any horrible mistakes as I did this.